we want to go to that's what I was thinking John chapter 20 is that it nope my bad whose responsibility was that <laughs> I've already fired myself, so. John chapter 20. Now we are at the end of uh, the three days of Jesus Christ being in the heart of the earth. And as kind of a side note here, Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth, by the way, for 72 hours. There's a lot of people that will teach you it's he wasn't in the in the tomb or in the buried for three full days and three full nights, but if you compare scripture with scripture, he had to be, and we can go through that if you want to, but regardless, um, in John chapter 20, it says this, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre, and then if you go on and read, obviously you know what we're getting into, this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ resurrected from the tomb on the first day of the week at 6 p.m., by the way, not 6 a.m. It was 6 a.m. before anybody saw him and realized that he had come out of the tomb, but it was 6 p.m. that he came out of the tomb. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He died. Uh, or was put in the tomb on Abib 14th, which was a Wednesday. And you know this, if you go through the book of Mark, it'll take you day by day, and as he gets closer to the crucifixion, hour by hour. So he was in there on 14th at 6 p.m. At 6 p.m. on the 14th, by the way, that's Passover. He's your Passover lamb. It's 6 p.m. now becomes the 15th. He was in there from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. on the 15th, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. on the 16th, uh, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. on the 17th. At 6 p.m. on the 17th, now becomes the 18th. So this is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or first day of the week. At 6 p.m., he came out of the tomb. Now, he wasn't seen until 6 a.m. He had been alive for 12 hours out of the tomb. But the key is, is that he came out of the tomb on the first day of the week. Okay, now flip over to uh, uh, Acts. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9 first. on where does it talk about them collecting before he gets there Paul says about taking up a collection before he gets there Maybe it's in 1 Corinthians. Oh, wait, here it is. Um, sorry, 1 Corinthians 16. And 
then there's a reference to Acts as well. And I'll find that here in a second. But 1 Corinthians chapter 16, look at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Then in verse 2 he says, Upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. They're taking up a collection when? The first day of the week. Why? Because that's when they gather together. Uh, let me see if I can find this reference in Acts. Maybe 18. Nope. When they say put your cross references in your Bible when you're thinking about it, do it. Because then when you need to find stuff, you've got your cross references. Um, somebody find to talk about the first day of the week in the book of Acts. I think it's late in the. They were gathered on the first day of the week or something of that nature. Yes, where is that? 27. I wasn't far enough in it. Acts 27 what? Oh, 20 verse 7. Acts 20 verse 7, it says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight. So they were meeting on the first day of the week when Paul preached to them. Now why were they meeting on the first day of the week? Because that was the day Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. The nation of Israel's Sabbath is on Saturday, the last day of the week, the day of rest. Christians, it's not a Sabbath, but the Christians gather together, and their day of, to dedicate to God is the first day of the week, because that's the day Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. And if you go over to Romans chapter 8, I believe, when Paul lays out um, basically comparing the law with the church, you'll find that he leaves the Sabbath out. Uh, Romans chapter 13. Uh, pick it up in verse 9. It says, For this thou shalt commit adultery, shalt, sorry, shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay? So he, he basically hits the first uh, commandments are those, um, well, all of them he lists there in verse 9, dealing with man towards man or man towards God, just as his original 10. But the only one he doesn't mention is honoring the Sabbath. Why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with Christianity anymore. Christianity now is centered around the first day of the week, the day that Jesus Christ resurrected. That's the day we come together. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we take communion, and what do we say? This do in remembrance of me. We do it on the first day of the week because that's the day Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. So everything shifts from the law and what God does with Israel now shifts over to focusing it on Jesus Christ for the church. It doesn't apply to the church, right? Technically, now hear me out. Be careful what I say here. Understand what I'm saying. Paul reiterates it here in chapter 13 that those apply, but technically we don't live under the Ten Commandments. 
They're a great moral law for us. And by Romans chapter 13, by the way, at the beginning of the chapter, he talks about how we're in subjection to the government. And the government has put forth laws that incorporate now the Ten Commandments, so we have to follow those rules. But by, by biblical speaking, we're not under the law, right? We're under the law of grace. The Old Testament law doesn't apply to us spiritually. What applies is what is taught from basically Romans to Philemon. Now, however, Paul does mention that here in Romans 13, that those... Things do apply, but they now only apply because he mentioned them here for our spiritual law, right? So anything that's mentioned under the law does not apply to us as Christians. Now, what this law is called now is the moral law or the royal law. Do unto thy uh, neighbor as you would do unto yourself or however they, you know, the golden rule. That's, that's the royal law. Yeah, do to your neighbor before they do to you. I think that's how it's worded. Whatever he said. You know the thing. Um, so we still have that. It, it's mentioned, I think, uh, in Galatians again. Yeah, Galatians chapter 6, I think, it's mentioned again. That's That's the royal law or the moral law. He sums it up in two ways. Why? Because... Half of the Old Testament law is our relationship with God, the first five or six commandments, and the other half is our relationship to mankind. So what does he say? He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and spirit. That's the first half of the Ten Commandments. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the second half of the Ten Commandments. So we still live under that moral principle and that royal principle, but it doesn't apply to us spiritually speaking, if that makes sense. Yeah. He said, I'm the father of the Sabbath. Or Lord of the Sabbath. Now that's that's not the New Testament local church. That's that's the nation of Israel before Acts chapter eight kicks into play. It's not the local church. That is the church in Jerusalem. Now, yeah, I mean that that if if you look at that, what is that? It, what kind of uh, government system is that? When everybody brings everything they have and then they distribute out evenly, it's socialism, right? That's not. That's not that is how the millennium is going to work to a, to a degree. That's not now. It's it's a good principle to live by in in certain aspects, but that's not what the Bible teaches for the the church age. But you know, you're you're I see what you're saying and that's it's a good principle in certain things. That's kind of how a church body kind of works in the sense of we we work to try to help everybody, you know, equally, not necessarily give everybody equally, but there's no limitations. You know, we 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 try to help liberally and equally to anybody that might need it. But in terms of the way we live our life, that's not the structure that we live under currently.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a weird, it's a weird, see the world tells that, it's opposite of what the world tells you. But what Christians find out when they finally give it up to God, like you just said, how it changes everything. Everything. No way. Sure. It's not commanded. And and for the for Christianity typically it's Sunday. Because that's, that's not the Lord's Day, by the way. Christianity will tell you when the Bible says the Lord's Day that that's Sunday. That's not Sunday. It's the first day of the week. The Lord's Day is the second advent. But that the day that you honor God, you should also honor him with your body in the sense of, of resting and rejuvenating. Um, if you go through and look at history, you look at the Bible, the seventh of so many things is crucial. You're supposed to let the land rest every seventh year. You're supposed to move your crops every, you know, rotate them every seven years on a seven-year cycle. Everything is, basically, well, every seven days your body needs a chance to recoup and your cells change every seven years or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. Does that help? Yeah, so you're not under any bound of, you know, God's, I, God is not, huh, yeah, right, she's like, oh, we're partying now, um, but yeah, it's, it's not a, it's not a command, well, sure, they need the attendance and the, Sure. Yep. Well, and that's okay. You you step into a whole other realm. We can get in the book of Proverbs uh, about honoring the Lord with the first. We've already talked about your money, but your time. It's the first day of the week, so what do we do? We honor God with that first day. We give back to him that day to begin our week. In the Old Testament, they didn't give, I mean, there was instances, I guess, don't get me wrong, like with the Feast of First Fruits on the 16th and stuff, where they would come and, and honor God with the first of the of the harvest. But it's it's different in Christianity. We're, we're called to, if, if you look, the first of everything, time, energy, money, the list goes on and on. We honor God. That starts with the first day of the week. Uh, it, it works the same all the way through. And if you if you think about it, um, you're only giving God a seventh rather than a tenth if you honor him with only one day of the week. So you need to find three, three parts of another day to honor him with somewhere. There we are. Thursday night. This is the third part. What's that? God's going to get his tithe. Let's just put it that way. Yeah.
Right. Now, that's a great question. That's a great question. And sometimes, I know why God does it. Sometimes I'm like, why did you do it that way? Because it messes people up, but I know why he does it that way. Because God wants to see our true heart in the matter. It's the same with Genesis. It's the same with Matthew. People want to start reading the Bible. Where do they start? Genesis. Or if they want to, I, I did this when I wanted to start getting serious about my relationship with God. I opened to Matthew because it's the start of the New Testament. It's about Jesus. I want to, and and you start reading all this stuff, and it's great. But if you don't have somebody there to help you explain what's really going on, then it can get you all messed up. Okay. Because, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 10 first. Let's do this. I know why God does it, though. Matthew chapter 10. And look at, um, now, in, at the beginning of chapter 10, he's commissioning the 12 apostles. And in verse 5, he says, These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so a lot happening right there. Jesus just commissioned the twelve apostles to go to the ends of the earth, right? And preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that what it said? No, it said... Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't even go to the Gentiles. Don't even go to the Samaritans who have half Jewish blood in them, but they're still half Gentile. They were unclean still in God's eyes, just as the Gentiles were unclean. If you go to Acts chapter 10, you'll get a great picture of what it means that a Gentile is unclean and a Jew is, is clean according to the law because that's when God sends Peter to Cornelius and Peter has the worst trouble trying to figure out how in the world God would send him to an unclean man to preach the gospel to him because the Gentiles are unclean. Jesus said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Now what do you tell him to go preach? Kingdom of heaven. That's Israel. Israel's written all over this. Jesus Christ is the king of the nation of Israel. And when he came, he came to be king to the Jews. Now when he died, he died for the sins of the whole world. But when he was here for three and a half years doing his ministry, he was here preaching to the nation of Israel. Now, he was preaching the kingdom of heaven. When will the kingdom of heaven be reinstituted? Now, he had it with him here. But what happened, remember, in Matthew chapter 13 that started off, kicked off the parables that we talked about? The nation of Israel outwardly rejected and they, they, they secretly rejected him in chapter 12 and in chapter 13. They outwardly, re outwardly rejected him. So his teachings went into mystery form called parables and everything was ceased from that point for the nation of Israel. But when Jesus came, he came king of, of, of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, both kingdoms. Kingdom of God is spiritual, kingdom of heaven is physical. When he was preaching, he was preaching to bring both kingdoms in and to, and to establish them. If they would have accepted the kingdom, what would that be? When, where in time would that take you? It would take you to here, the millennium. The church age would not have existed the way we understand it today because he would have been crowned king He'd have sat on the throne in Jerusalem, and he would have reigned for a thousand years, and the millennium would have kicked off. Okay? So when he came preaching, what was he teaching and preaching? The millennial kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of God, because they'll both be present there again. So, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you know them as probably the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. He was preaching, uh, well, look back at verse 23 of, of chapter uh, 4, right before chapter 5 kicks off. 
He says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Is that the gospel you and I follow? No, we follow the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't follow the gospel of the kingdom. What he lays out in chapters 5, 6, and 7 is what will take place and what will be instituted once the tribulation's over and the millennium starts. The gospel of the kingdom. So what you're reading in 5, 6, and 7 is the millennial gospel. You're reading something that's going to take place somewhere out in the future. Now, he was trying to instill it there. He was trying to implement it there. But the, the, the sole factor of him implementing that was the nation of Israel accepting him as their Messiah. And if they would have done that, then what he preached there would have been put forth and the gospel of the kingdom would have been set in place. And the, that's what they would have been living by at that point forward. So, again, these make a great moral compass for you and I as Christians. A lot of them. Uh, but they don't help us when it comes to doctrine. Because it's not the doctrine of the church. It's the doctrine, doctrine to the millennium. Which is the, uh, what, tenth dispensation? We're, we're still in the eighth. We're not there yet. So, um, read them. Understand them. Know them because Jesus taught it. And, and use them. Like Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I believe, I believe, practically speaking, that's a great verse. I believe if you're merciful with people, people will show mercy towards you, and including God. If you're, if you're gracious with God, God will be gracious with you. But that's not doctrine to the church. That doesn't get you salvation, I guess is what I'm, what, how I should word that. In the millennium, they have to live by that. Just like in the Old Testament, they had to honor the Sabbath. They had to do that. If they didn't, they were removed from the land and they lost their relationship with God. You don't have to be merciful as a Christian. You'll still go to heaven. But it's a good, it's a good thing to live by. It doesn't affect your salvation. In the millennium, it will affect their salvation. It doesn't affect our salvation. The only thing that affects our salvation is whether you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and resurrected the third day. That's the only thing that affects your salvation. You either believe it and you're saved and you confess it and you're saved, or you don't believe it and you die and go to hell. Now in the millennium, this is what they're going to be judged by. Just like in the Old Testament, you go into Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. That's what they were judged by. And I, I, I'm going to say it till I can't say it anymore. We live in the 6,000 years of history. We live in the greatest time period you could ever live in. The gospel of the grace of God. Because, you know, the judgment seat may not be fun for, for me and a lot of us, but at least I don't. my salvation doesn't hinge on what I do and think and say now. Jesus Christ, it all hinges on Jesus Christ. Because I guarantee you, if I could lose my salvation, I'd have done lost it. So I'm thankful that I don't have to fight to keep it. So that what you're reading in there is what Jesus is going to command in the future. He was trying to do it there, but he couldn't implement it until he became king, officially by the, the nation of Israel. Uh, yeah, there'll be people that choose not to follow God in the millennium. And that's why what we talked about last week with Satan being loose for a short season, that's those kind of people are the people he's going to gather up with him and take one last swipe at God at the Battle of Gog and Magog. And then they'll be cast, wiped out at that battle. That's a heavenly battle, a universal battle. right? So yeah, the millennium will consist of people that... now. They won't be able to physically uh, cause any problems because we live under a perfect rule. And the thought is we as Christians will, will help Jesus Christ rule and keep peace and, and perfection to the best of what 
we'll be able to still living under this current earth, but in a more perfect sense. That is a picture of the, the last church age before the rapture. People that live. Now that will carry over doctrinally into the tribulation, but that's a picture of how Christianity will be in the last days, in the last few decades before Jesus comes back. Were you get ready to say something? No, oh, I thought I heard another voice. Um, maybe it was, yep. Yep. That's right. The blood of bulls and ghosts does not take away the sin of the world. That is why when somebody died in the Old Testament living under the law and will die in the tribulation living under the law, they don't go to heaven. Where do they go? Abraham's bosom. The spirits in hell in Abraham's bosom were awaiting the final sacrifice, the sacrifice that would actually cleanse them from their sin. That's why they couldn't go to heaven until after Jesus died and came and got them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For instance, Yes, exactly. That's a good point. Um, look at, um, go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. So in Mark chapter 16, <laughs> she got her questions answered. She's out. I'm just kidding. Absolutely. We'll talk to you. Uh, Mark, chap Mark chapter 16 and verse 14. Now, to the people that believe that all of the signs and things that Jesus commands the apostles to go out and do during his ministry and after his resurrection, that believe that that's a commission for the church, uh, somehow they miss Mark chapter 16. Uh, it says, Afterward he appeared un, uh, to the eleven as they sat at meat and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had, uh, which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay? We got a couple things going on right there in verse... Uh, 16. Either the Bible contradicts itself or parts of Christianity teach false doctrine or nobody knows what's going on. Because it says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now here's what here's what always gets me when people and look and I say this not with any kind of pride or anything because I don't understand all the Bible. But I just try to make it simple and plain. If when you read something and, and you try to make it fit into Christianity when it doesn't match what's being taught in Christianity, 
then you have to stop and say, okay, why is this different? What is different about this? I can't find anywhere that Paul says, as Brian mentioned, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. No other apostle had that commission to him. Nowhere does he teach you have to be baptized to be saved. It's different here. So either, like I said, there's a contradiction and the Bible's wrong, or I'm reading something different. Now, I take the stance that the Bible is always correct because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So therefore, there's something different. It's like Sesame Street. One of these, three of these things are the same, one's different. And then you've got to figure out why it doesn't go there. That's where I have to take my brain, you know, to make it simple. i got to go back to Sesame Street. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So, obviously, I'm not reading something tied to Christianity. But, if I was, let's keep reading. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. And they shall speak in with new tongues. Man, this is great. I get to go cast out devils. I get to speak in tongues. Uh, and then I can drop down to verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up to heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with the signs following. Amen. Boy, Christianity is great. Except that there's a problem, right? What's the problem? I left out verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And wait a minute. I don't see that being taught and preached and being used. And there's other instances of this in other parts of the Gospels. You can't just cut out things that don't match and then try to apply the other things that you want to match. The reason this doesn't match is because this is not written to Christians. This is written to the 12, well, only 11 now at this point, the 11 apostles who were the apostles to who? Matthew chapter 10, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that's the problem you get into with the teachings of Jesus doctrinally trying to apply them to the church. There are some things that do match. I'm not disagreeing, but there are lots of things that don't. And that's where you have to be careful on where you cross those lines and, and try to make things fit where they don't fit. Church of Christ believe you have to be baptized. Yeah, they use about they use about four verses in the Bible to make their mainstay. Verses like this, Acts two thirty eight. Um, they they take the the verses in the Gospels, or not the Gospels, the like Ephesians chapter four where it says one baptism. They make that water baptism, even though nowhere in the chapter does it mention water. It's talking about the spiritual baptism that happens to your soul. When you immerse it in the blood of Jesus Christ, just pull things out of context and make them say something it doesn't say, and go from there. Because God still wasn't done. He still gave him another shot. And that's what Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 is all about. Not yet. Nope. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Now the process may be starting, but he still wasn't done with the nation of Israel. Why did he give him another shot? I don't know. Why did he give me multiple chances?
Um, pick it up in, um, I mean, really, we could read the whole chapter, but try to save. Well, this will this will match. Well, uh, no, we need to start. Start in verse six, chapter one, verse six. He's talking to the disciples here, not Christian disciples, disciples that he talked to while he was teaching. Look what he says in verse six. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, "Lord, will at this time restore again the kingdom to?" Israel and there is the plaguing question that you could trace all the way through the Gospels that the disciples were were interested in Let me ask you a question outside of Trying to get the rapture here quicker and you know get the nation of Israel on with what they need to get done to, to get the rapture here. When have you ever been concerned about the kingdom coming back to Israel? I, I mean in reality, that means nothing to us, right? That's our question is either when's the rapture or how do we work in Christianity? How do we strengthen the gospel of Jesus Christ? These disciples worry about the kingdom being restored to Israel. Why? They've been waiting since Daniel, really before that. But Daniel made a prophecy in Daniel chapter nine about there being there seventy weeks until the Messiah will be will be here and he'll present the kingdom even though they were told after 69 weeks he'll be cut off they were still hopeful because now they understood that he was cut off he just got cut off 40 days ago when they crucified him so now they're saying well thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel they thought this has to be it he was cut off now the 70 weeks is going to go into play and we're going to we're going to be able to crown him he said, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. That's Israel. Then Samaria and other most parts of the earth. That preaching of the kingdom of Israel is going to go out. What's he preaching? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The kingdom of heaven. That's what they're preparing for. Then he goes down when, when, when they get the um, gift of tongues. Down in chapter 2. Uh, notice what he says in verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem. Who? Jews. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Okay, what, what happened? Well, what happened is in 606 B.C., the nation of Israel was taken captive to Babylon. And for 70 years they lived in Babylon. We're reading right now in the book of Esther about a group of people who did not make the pilgrimage back under Ezra and Nehemiah. They stayed in Shushan. They stayed in Babylon. So you had Jews scattered there. Then in 400 B.C., God ceased to exist working with the nation of Israel. And he, for 400 years, God did nothing with the nation of Israel. How many generations is 400 years? Six to seven, probably. You remember people six to seven generations back in your family? What language were they speaking? Where did they live? How did they live? What did they study? 400 years ago... This book was barely out on the press. It wasn't even in its final form yet. And and people still didn't have a Bible in their hand yet. It was still an uncommon practice for every family to have a Bible. That was the purpose for getting this Bible out. Think how much how many different languages the Jews were speaking. They were probably in parts of Africa, Asia, northern Europe all over the place, speaking who knows what language. So what did God do? He gathered them back together because this might be the moment the kingdom was restored to Israel because the king was here, but they didn't all speak Greek or Hebrew. They spoke whatever language they had been, wherever they had been living. So God gave 
Those 11 apostles, well, 12 now with Barnabas, those 12 apostles, the ability to speak a language that they had never spoke before so that every one of those Jews and devout men out of every nation would hear the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, not the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Those are biblical tongues. So then what happens from there? Peter goes on and preaches a message. Um, well, he preaches his first message in 115. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, and he takes him all the way back to David, and he preaches to the nation of Israel. Then he preaches another message in 214, but Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said, who's he talking to? Read the verse. Ye men of who? Judea. And he takes you all the way through Joel and all the way back into the Old Testament prophets. And he preaches uh, for a long time. Then in uh, 3.12, he starts his third message. And when Peter saw it, he answered and said unto the people, Ye men of Israel. Then in 4.8, he stands up for his fourth message. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of then in 419, he stands up and says, But Peter and John answered and said to them, uh, and the them there is still Israel. And then all of a sudden in um, Acts chapter 7, a different guy stands up. In verse 1 said, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. Is Abraham your father? No. Who is he talking to? It's Israel. It's all about Israel. There's not one saved Christian in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. They're all hearing the message of the King, Messiah, Jesus Christ, Preaching about, not him preaching, but preaching about the king, Jesus Christ, coming to establish the kingdom of heaven to Israel. And that's what the message that the 11 apostles, and the Great Commission, by the way, is not a commission to the church. It makes a good practical commission, but doctrinally it's not a commission to the church, nor is Matthew 16. It's a commission to the 11 apostles to take the message of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus preached in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 to the world. Why? Why? Why would he, knowing that there was only a few days left, why would he send them out and tell them to go to the uttermost parts of the earth? Because in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Jesus, maybe Jesus knew, but he wasn't going to tell the apostles yet. Maybe that thing drug out for another three years. I don't know. So, but now we know prophetically that what Jesus is telling them to do is take that message to the ends of the earth is now what they're going to do in the millennium. So yeah, it gets very whirlwindy when you start getting into the end of the Gospels, first part of Acts, even all of Acts, because what you got in the book of Acts is God now decompressing himself away from Israel and now inputting himself into the Gentiles to begin to build the church. But sometimes at the same time, there's stuff going on. He even has, Paul even has to get on Peter, and he gets on a couple different people. Uh, in the book of Acts because they're preaching the wrong stuff. There's that one fellow who's preaching the baptism of John. I mean, shoot, at least Peter was preaching the kingdom of heaven. This guy is preaching the baptism of John, which is 33 years earlier. Oh, it's a mess. And by the way, what's the full name of the book of Acts? Acts of the Apostles.
Yep. Go to um, go to Galatians. Okay. When when did what chapter did Paul get saved? Acts chapter nine. Two chapters after the Ethiopian eunuch. So he didn't get even get saved until Acts chapter nine. Now this is going to blow your mind. And let me see if I have a, a time reference written down on Acts chapter 9. It, it's not fairly long after 33. It may even still be in there. I have chapter 9 starting around 35 AD. So we're, we're at least a year and a half out of the resurrection before Paul even gets saved. This is going to blow your mind. Um... Turn to Galatians. Whoops, I'm in Ephesians. I think it's four I want. We'll have to finish with this one. Um, da -dum -dum. Galatians chapter one. Buckle your seatbelt. Everybody put your hands in the air. We're getting ready to go down the hill. All right. Galatians chapter 1. Uh, let's see. Let's pick it up. Man, it could start in the beginning. All right. Let's pick it up in um, 13. For ye have heard of my conversion in time past in the Jews' religion. Okay. P P uh, Paul was a Judy, uh, uh, part of the Judaites. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, where did that happen? Acts chapter 9, around 35 A.D. To reveal his son in me that I might preach among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. What's in Arabia? Mount Sinai. Same place Moses got the Ten Commandments. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is where it's going to get good. So Paul didn't get saved till around 35 A.D., a year and a half after the, the resurrection. When he was called by God, he conferred only with God. He didn't go to another man and say, hey, what do you think about this? He didn't go up to Jerusalem to the... The, the great men of the synagogue and the Pharisees and Sadducees and say, hey, what do you think about this? He said, I went straight where God told me to go, and that was down to Arabia. A year and a half after the resurrection. What happened there? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. What happened? Paul went down to Arabia, and he was caught up to the third heaven. And God spoke to him unspeakable riches. You know what God spoke to him? Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Mm, let's see, Ephesians 1, verse 9. 
having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You know what Paul got? The revelation of the mystery of the church. Paul was the very first one who was revealed to about the mystery of the church. You know what the mystery of the church is? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The fact that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, or that God was manifest in the flesh, and he brought to this earth salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection. A year and a half after the resurrection. Isn't that crazy to think about? We always think it happened right away, that Jesus resurrected, and then boom, the church started. People were getting saved left and right by the grace of God, and off and running we were. Paul didn't even get the mystery revealed to him in a year and a half after the church age, or the resurrection. You know what was going on during that time? Peter was preaching. Stephen was preaching. The other, the other apostles were going out to the ends of the earth, and they were preaching. So there was a lot going on in that year and a half, two years after the resurrection. For us, it's just a flip of a page. You're probably looking at a couple years before the church really got up and off the ground, the full mystery. Think about that. We didn't have social media back then. Well, they didn't. They didn't have cell phones and the Internet. It wasn't like God gave Paul the, the mystery revealed and then Paul got on the Internet and started a blog about what he saw. No, he had to walk to the first person he saw and tell him. Then he had to walk to the first city, tell him. And what do you think, especially the Jews were thinking, even the Gentiles, wait, you tell me the God that hated us for uh, 4,000 years all of a sudden wants to have a relationship with us? Come on, you're crazy. How do you, what kind of welcome do you think Paul got with a lot of those? Probably like Noah. I'm building this boat because it's going to rain, flood the earth out. What's rain? Paul did before he got saved, yeah. Well, the, first, the last one we know of that he was persecuting was Stephen. He said that Saul stood by, uh, what's the word he used, and he didn't... He, it's not that he was doing the persecution, but he was watching it, and he was good with it. He wanted him dead. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Consented unto his death. That's what it said. He was persecuting Jews. He was. He, but he wasn't He wasn't a – it's what he said. He was using it for a, basically an a, – a, money gain he wasn't practicing in the way that he he was a pharisee and sadducee basically he was doing all that no he was persecuting god's people well so there so obviously you have there's a period in between stephen or the resurrection and god revealing the mystery to him and so what you probably got going on is, is this window. Well, you see it with the Ethiopian eunuch. Peter went and preached that message. I mean, uh, Philip went and preached that message. There was obviously men, people being saved, so to speak. But it, it wasn't a, a known thing on a, on a large scale until Paul got it and started teaching it and writing it down and, and starting churches and, and evangelizing. But yeah, there's a window there where God's working with people based off the resurrection. But doctrinally, it wasn't implemented until Paul got it all. And and uh, for those two years after the resurrection, yeah, he was probably persecuting people that were following Christ at that point. But we don't have any re uh, we don't have any um, written testimony of anybody preaching. Christ resurrected uh, before Paul gets saved other than the Ethiopian eunuch. And that only came because God sent Philip there on the spot to tell him Philip didn't even really know what he was preaching. Is 
No. Nope. Nope. They were told to go preach. They were not told to preach Christ crucified. They were told to preach the kingdom of heaven. That's what they were preaching. And until God revealed the mystery to Paul about the church age, they were in this in-between phase. And, and what we have with the Ethiopian eunuch is probably uh, God giving us a picture of how God was working during that interim period. He was sending those men out. and But what was the Ethiopian eunuch reading? Isaiah 53, about a man being led to the slaughter, dumb uh, like a she, uh, uh, sheep, and he didn't know what he was reading. God told him to tell him, you're reading about Jesus Christ. And the eunuch said, well, shouldn't I be baptized? Why would he say that? Because that's what they were preached. Peter was preaching, be baptized for the remission of sin. So he thought he needed to be baptized. And what was his answer to him? You can be baptized, but you have to believe first. That's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's the millennial gospel. That's what the Jews were getting preached. Because they, they were, Christ came to implement this. They rejected him, so it brought this. God's going to pour out his wrath here on his people for this. So these 2,000 years is kind of a, a parenthesis in time of God working with his people. Now, what would he have done if they would have accepted him? I don't know. He would have worked it all out somehow. But No, I don't. We know that because the eunuch, God was still saving people. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it wasn't understood what was going on until Paul got the full gamut of the church age, that God was now going to work this way through the grace of God, that Jesus Christ was not only the king of the Jews, but now he's the savior of the world. They didn't, those Jews didn't understand that. So they had to transition their mind. And in the meantime, until Paul revealed all that, the apostles were still preaching baptism for the remission of sin. And, and except for the guys that God was dealing with independently, like the eunuch, about, but here's the thing, and it, we're like way over time, and we're going to step way out in the weeds here. If you read the account of the eunuch, it's never mentioned about anything about the death, burial, and resurrection. All Philip says is you have to believe. So don't get me wrong. I believe that the church age was full in effect, definitely after Stephen died. But my point to tell you was in the book of Acts, we see it as it all just happened. But there was gaps of God working and doing things. The apostles were still preaching what they were told to preach by Jesus for a couple years until Paul began the process of implementing what we now know as the church age. And even even though he got it two year, a year and a half to two years after, it still took how much time to get that information from, from uh, Jerusalem out. So you're talking decades. Yeah, we see that now. Right.
Depends on when they died. The Jews didn't. They just thought that their king was murdered. Now, again, I'm making it very black and white. And I can promise you that God was had about 9 million tentacles out at the same time working all this. And he was working with individual people individually. Again, going back to the Ethiop that Ethiopian eunuch, that story makes so many things, shows how God was doing so many things at once. God was dealing with that eunuch one-on-one. -on -one, that and and he would do, was doing that, I guarantee, the same way he works with us one-on-one. -on -one. He brought everybody what they needed, where they were at, with what they needed, how they needed it, just like he always has. They would have had to get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, they had to become Christians. And that's what makes it hard to live through different dispensations. It would be like now. Now, obviously, we can't. But if somebody, if an unsaved person, goes into tribulation, they have to get saved based on where they're at now. They can't save. Right. Now, yes, that's what I said. He'd deal with everybody individually. Now, let me let me put another little kink in this here. Because God didn't deal with the, the thief on the cross that way. Technically speaking, the thief on the cross was under the law and the ministry of Jesus Christ. All he did was confess that Jesus was Lord and ask forgiveness, and he went to paradise. So there's a lot of things crossing during this period of time right here. There's about a probably a 40-year span where there was lots of things going on, and I would not ever come to one place and say this is this is the only way God was doing it at this time, and that's why the book of Acts, well, really, from Matthew 1 to Acts 28, you get yourself in real trouble if you're trying to start saying this is how it is. This is how it is. This is how it is. Nope. Yep, you just have to, yep, you got to be careful. You're in there. That's why do not pull doctrine out of those places. Stick with Romans to Philemon. That's where you got to live. Now read the other stuff. And if it matches what's in the church epistles, then you're fine. But if it doesn't match, apply it practically to your life. Make yourself a good, better, moral Christian, and you'll be good. Just don't try to make it what it's not. That's church doctrine. That was a good study tonight.